Welcome to this week's Local Matters. I'm Elizabeth, let's get started. Are you a cat person? Many of us share our lives and homes with one or more cats as beloved pets, but stray cats or community cats who live outdoors deserve the chance to be cared for and nurtured too. The only humane, effective approach to caring for these felines is to trap, neuter, or spay, and then return or provide them with an outdoor home. With recognition of the fact that they are not adoptable into homes as they aren't socialized to humans, the Town of Plymouth's Animal Control Office has developed a placement program. If you own a barn, stable, shop, brewery, winery, or warehouse, you can save feline lives by adopting working cats. The town will vaccinate and spay or neuter the cats for you, and thereafter, you provide daily food and water, shelter, and long-term veterinary care because all animals deserve a chance to live a healthy and happy life. To learn more and get an application, call the Plymouth Animal Control Office at 508-830-4218. June Summer is the president of the South Shore Food Truck Association and owner of the popular food truck, Mom on the Go. June visited with Julie via Zoom. Welcome, June. Thanks so much for joining us today. I want to dive right into how you got into this business where you're, you own your mom-on-the-go food truck. How did you end up here? Oh, boy. Uh, it, 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 it took a while. I was um, in insurance for many years in the business world uh, for like 23 years, but I've always loved to cook and travel and and uh, food has always been my thing. So uh, about two years before um, I got the food truck, I started research because I really wanted to own a food truck. Um, so then after uh, the two years of research, I went for it. I bought a truck and jumped in. That was um, 2016, almost, yeah, five years ago. Wow, good for you. Yeah. Now, um, you're the president of the South Shore Food Truck Association. So let's talk yeah. about um, participants in the association. I went on the website to see, and there's there's food trucks from all over the place. It's not just the South Shore. It's 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 quite far reaching how many trucks are involved in this association. So why do participants join and what is the advantage of joining the Food Truck Association? Yeah, so, you know, coming from an insurance background, we always had associations. It's a very old industry. Um, food trucking is obviously a newer industry and there wasn't any association. So about a year after I had my food truck, I started asking uh, some of the other food trucks, geez, do you want to kind of form an association? And honestly, at the beginning, um, everyone was a little suspicious of why would we do this? And, you know, and my philosophy has always been, you know, um, a rising tide raises all ships. So, you know, when you own a food truck, it's very singular. And, you know, you're committing to sometimes people's weddings or graduations, things that are, you know, important in people's lives. And I always worried about, the truck breaking down or, or, you know, me not being able to get to a committed event. So I thought, gee, you know, it'd be great to have sort of a network. And then there's also the, um, the, the places, the larger places that want uh, multiple food trucks. And there was no place, no way to really coordinate that. So um, I started the association and we started off with, you know, 10 trucks and, uh, you know, now we have like almost 35 members. Um, and we just, we named it the South Shore Food Truck Association um, because at one time there was a Boston Association, but now that's, that's um, defunct. So um, trucks from all over kind of, you know, ask and, and want to join and so forth. But the benefit is, um, you know, camaraderie. We learn from each other. New trucks get a ton of information. Um, now we get, we have sort of leverage with festivals. So in other words, if a organizer wants to set up a festival, they'll come to us and our trucks get asked to be at these things first, you know, because we're organized. And now there's a way to, you know, a website so people can go on and book trucks. And it's just been a, a great experience. Yeah, it's, it's, I was pretty amazed when I went on the website because you don't realize, you see a food truck here or there and you don't realize how many there are and how many different offerings they have. Some are just desserts, some are full, you know, Italian, some are seafood. Um, yeah. it's, it's really interesting. And that was a good point about your kind of a mutual aid uh, for each other. Um, we've yes. noticed that, especially like in the craft uh, 
brewing industry around here, uh, restaurants uh, in Plymouth, they tend to really um, support each other, especially over the past year, which has been wonderful. That's terrific. Yeah, sure. And I had a question. Are food trucks more often hired to do a private event, a specialty occasion, or is more of your business geared towards the, the more um, uh, public uh, uh, offerings, like public events, like fairs or festivals? What percentage of your business is which? Well, so every, every food truck's a little different. We always say that there's three um, revenue streams for food trucks, and you know one of them is the festivals. Uh, another one would be the, the private catering. And then the third leg of that would be um, if you're at a specific spot all the time. Um, so kind of vending daily. So, you know, each truck has sort of a different mix. So we have um, Mom on the Go uh, has, we have two trucks now and we don't do any um, daily vending. Uh, we don't have a specific spot. So we only do private catering and um, festivals. So, but, you know, another truck might, just have a daily spot. So it depends on how you, you know, want to run your food truck business. Sure. And, and you have all, all kinds of options, which is really cool. Now, what types yeah. of permits or permissions do you need to um, obtain from either the towns that you're in or, or can you explain how that process goes? Yeah, um, it's, it's actually one of the, um, one of the additional reasons we, we kind of founded an association. There are other states uh, where you get, say, a statewide permit. Um, but in Massachusetts, it's up to each individual town. So every town that we go to, we have to get a permit and um, it costs us thousands of dollars a year. So if you go to 15 towns, you have to uh, be inspected in each town. Um, you know, in addition to having your surf safe certification, your allergen, your fire department permit, your hawkers and peddlers from the state. So it's, it's very cumbersome in Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, we hope someday to kind of get that changed. You know, in California, they do it by county. Right. Um, you know, in other states they do, you know, you get licensed for the year in your home base yep. and other towns. And you're all have set. To accept. Yeah. So yeah. for people but around here, when they see a food truck at any given location, whether it's a private entity or a, or a public uh, affair, we're, we'll know that you've been fully vetted and that you're you're a safe and you're you're a, yeah. you're a good uh, a, a good offering of food and people don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it's 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 funny because um, restaurants can be um, usually inspected three times a year, and you know my food trucks, for example, if I have to do you know um, fifteen towns, we're expect we're inspected like forty five times a year, so we you can feel very safe. Uh, eating off a food truck. I think there's a little bit of leftover, you know, 20, 30 years ago with the roach coach, uh, you know, mentality, which is a very different thing. It's not, they're not mobile kitchens. Um, so, you know, there's some of that left over, but yeah, we're inspected um, way more than, than restaurants are. That's wonderful. So you're really, really safe. Now during the pandemic, were there lots of changes of protocols for you for safety, food safety? Yeah. Um, so a lot of trucks, um, you know, didn't open at all. Um, and then, you know, we did, I have uh, two trucks. Uh, it was ironic because my second truck was delivered to me uh, in March of 2020. So uh, we never uh, ended up, you know, using the second truck. There just wasn't enough work. And we um, really had to change uh, everything we did. So there were no festivals and there were no uh, private events. Uh, so we started going around to neighborhoods and we'd do you know, 15, 20 people, but we'd have to do that three or four times a day. Um, and you know, with an ice cream truck, you know, people think, oh, you know, they can drive around and play their music, but a food truck is a little different. You have to set up your, you know, your grill, your fryer, your, so the setup and breakdown on a food truck is a different thing. So it was hugely labor intensive to probably make about 25% of a, the income. Oh, absolutely. And how do you how do you plan on how much food you bring? I mean, how, what if you run out after an hour? I mean, how do you how do you? Yeah, that, that's the magic question. So um, I think new food trucks, you know, their first year, that's the most difficult um, part uh, is to know how much to bring. Well, first of all, we're constrained by um, the size and how much we can bring. Um, so, you know, you get better at it. Uh, you know, you know, if you're going to serve a hundred people, how much you need to bring, 
festivals, it can be, you know, a, a crapshoot, you know, you just load up as much as you can. But, you know, sometimes we show up to an event where there's supposed to be 100 people, but there's 200. So the last half an hour, you run out of certain items or um, so it, it is difficult. And it's just something you learn uh, with experience over time. Now, would you suggest this as a, as a business to, uh, an entrepreneur who's looking for something different and something um, lucrative to do? Yeah. It's a really fun business. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, I owned a restaurant for a year, a pop-up, um, while I had my food truck. And um, I have to say food trucking is a lot more fun than mm -hmm. owning a restaurant, in my opinion. Um, you, you're at a different location every day. Mm -hmm. You're seeing all different people. People um, are super excited when you pull up. So you don't have too many jobs where you pull up and they're, yay. Uh, so that's really great. Um, it's also probably the hardest job I've ever had uh, physically. It's an extremely physically demanding job. Um, so if it's 80 degrees out, um, you can be guaranteed that it's, you know, uh, 95 to 105 inside the food truck. Sure. Um, sure. Regardless of what we do. So, you know, when it gets up to 90 it, outside, it gets pretty, pretty hot in there. So it's, um, it's very grueling. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Every day is different. It's, it, is, it is lucrative to answer your question. I mean, it can be, I think, like I said, the first year you make all your mistakes, yeah. you know, you buy too much food, you don't buy enough food. Yeah. Um, but it's like any other business, you have to watch your costs and, yep. and all of that. Yep. And you learn as you go. Um, do you yeah. have any uh, upcoming events um, and, and where would people go to well, find out where you're going to be? Yeah. So one of the things that the association um, has done is we started four years ago at the Hanover Mall uh, doing uh, like a food truck Tuesday. So we had like five or six trucks and, and people would come. So we're in our fourth year now. Um, so in Hanover, we do Tuesdays and Thursdays, four to seven at Forge Pond Park. And we have 10 trucks that are there. Um, and we run that April through October. And now we just started uh, doing it in Abington um, on Wednesday nights. And um, normally when we've done this in the past, it takes kind of a few weeks to get uh, up and running before the crowd you know, uh, knows about it and social media. Um, this year we were uh, hit uh, full tilt the day we opened. Um, I think people were so sick of being inside. They're so excited to get out and, and do things. So um, those three are some of our regular events, but in uh, Weymouth just approved um, Friday nights. Um, so they're all of a sudden, you know, normally what we do in February and March is book our festivals, our private events, you know, that didn't really happen this year, but I can tell you it's happened over the last, you know, three weeks. I mean, sure. We're getting 20, Everybody's, yeah. 20, <laughs> Everybody's dying going. That was my last question was you have seasonal issues where clearly in, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm, you're not going to probably bring your, your food truck anywhere, but you, you're saying you, you do a lot of your planning during those those off months yeah, yeah. i would say 90 percent of food trucks um here in this area shut down for january and february sure it's just not uh worth it you have to prevent your tanks from freezing because yeah. we have water tank yeah so you know there's no heat in food trucks yeah um i mean obviously <laughs> if you're cooking it kind no of no air conditioning no heat <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, you know, it's it's difficult to be, but but some do. A few stay open. They might have a regular spot that they go to, or, or whatever. But yeah, um, yeah most of the t most of us, you know, shut down and then do kind of our planning and booking yeah. over January, February. Very interesting. Thank you so much for shedding some light on this industry, which I knew nothing about, yeah. and it's very, very fascinating. Uh, we've enjoyed having you, and you have a wonderful and uh, successful summer. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. To learn more, visit SouthShoreFoodTruckAssociation.org. The rise of the internet has exponentially exploded the amount of information and media that we're exposed to daily. News stories, once relegated to 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock time slots on just a few television channels, are now on a 24-hour cycle with too many sources to keep track of. Trying to stay informed about what is happening in our communities, country, and world should be easier than ever, but the blur between news, entertainment, and what constitutes a reliable source can make it not just confusing, but feel impossible. On Thursday, June 10th at 6.30 p.m., join the Kingston Public Library for the online program, How to Read the News. 
delivered by Professor Hank Sennett of Bridgewater State University, you'll discuss the importance of laterally checking multiple news sources, critical thinking, how news stories are covered, and the implications for a society in which two people can read the identical news story and come to drastically different conclusions. There will be time for a question and answer session as well. To register, visit the Kingston Public Library website. Plymouth Pride is an organization promoting equality and inclusivity in our community while fostering education, awareness, respect, and visibility. They are happy to announce that Pride is happening here in Plymouth this year on the weekend of June 26th and 27th. We'll have more details about the Pride Rally on June 26th for you in a couple of weeks. On Sunday, June 27th from 12 to 5 p.m., Plymouth Pride Fest will take place at Mayflower Brewing and they've put out a call for volunteers and vendors. There will be space for retail, activity, and nonprofits. If you're interested, email PlymouthPride2020 at gmail.com with your name, website, and product description. For more information, visit the Plymouth Pride Facebook page or call Nicole at 781-217-4438 with any questions you may have. Keith is here with In Focus Snapshot. Hi, I'm Keith Hughes, and welcome to In Focus Snapshot, where we take a look at the stories from the state and our communities that you may have missed. Interest in green gardening is on the rise, and the town of Pembroke is joining in. The town's offering a webinar through the University of Vermont entitled Soak Up the Rain, New England, with speakers presenting information on ways to implement green infrastructure approaches to managing stormwater. It will be held on June 8th at 10.30 a.m., and the topic will focus on stormwater bioretention systems. You can find out more and register by visiting the town's website and clicking on the town news tab on the main page. For more information on Soak Up the Rain, you can visit epa.gov backslash soak up the rain. The weather's getting warmer and that means the bugs are coming out. The Plymouth County Mosquito Control Project will begin truck-based adulticide applications on June 1st through October. Spraying is conducted between 2 a.m. and sunrise Monday through Friday. Plymouth County residents can request a spraying of their area and sign up to be notified of when it will occur. A list of the streets to be sprayed the following day will be updated by 2.30 p.m. on the project's website, PlymouthMosquito.org. From the State House, the baker Polito administration has announced that more than $70 million in funding is being provided to school districts and community organizations in the Commonwealth to offer summer learning programs. These programs are intended to support students after a year of remote and hybrid learning, the administration is committed to providing funding for several initiatives. You can learn more by contacting DESE Summer Programming at Mass.gov. Senator Susan Moran recently announced that in the final round of grants from the Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation, the Plymouth Barnstable District received $45,000 in direct grants and over a million dollars in eligible loan forgiveness for local small businesses. The grants are aimed at helping local businesses get out of debt and be a part of the Commonwealth's economic recovery. This round of grants caps off a program that has brought millions in relief to the Plymouth area and helped to keep the economy going during the pandemic. Thanks for watching this edition of In Focus Snapshot. I'm Keith Hughes, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Keith. The Pembroke Public Library is excited to announce their first in-person event series of the year. Every Tuesday until June 29th at 10.30 a.m., parents and their children, aged 3 to 5, are invited to enjoy Big Ryan's Tall Tales in the outdoor back garden. This six-week series, where language comes alive, will have lots of interaction, laughter, and of course, reading. This program is generously provided by the South Shore Family Network, a program of the South Shore Community Action Council. Registration is required. Visit the library website to sign up. With multiple options for live music and art, shopping, fine and casual dining in a beautiful locale, Plymouth is proud of her vibrant downtown. And Celebrate Greater Plymouth offers a free taste of everything it has to offer on first Saturdays of every month from June through December in 2021. 
Look for businesses displaying First Saturday flags or signs to receive special deals from the many performing art centers, antique stores, boutiques, art galleries, retail shops, restaurants, bars, and museums. And don't miss First Saturday's Art on the Green on the Town Hall lawn from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. With the world now opening back up and a host of new establishments opening here with it, there's never been a better time to be in Plymouth. For more information about First Saturdays, visit PlymouthFirstSaturdays.com. As part of First Saturdays, Pilgrim Hall Museum, the Pilgrim Society and Plymouth Antiquarian Society partner to present a different historical exploration each month. Plymouth's first African Americans will be the topic on June 5th at 1 p.m. Presented virtually by Dr. Donna Curtin, Executive Director of Pilgrim Hall Museum. This event will be live streamed on the Pilgrim Hall website and will be archived for future viewing. To learn more about these first Saturday presentations, visit the website at pilgrimhall.org. Kids aged 5 through 10 are invited to express themselves in neon with a virtual art class taught by teacher Melissa Kowal through the Kingston Public Library. Register via the library's website for this June 10th from 3 to 4.30 p.m. class and you'll receive an email when your free kit of supplies is ready to be picked up a few days before the fun. Next up is our friends from Middle Street School of Music in Plymouth with their beautiful cover of the Eagle song, Desperado. Hi, this is Paul Kinnear. I'm Pat Drain from Middle Street School of Music. This is a classic from Don Henley and Glenn Fry. <laughs>
Thank you, Middle Street School of Music. And thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a happy and safe week. We'll see you next time. Thank you.